You're likely familiar with Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail. What you may not know is what, exactly, landed King behind bars. It may surprise you, but the answer to that question is just as relevant today as it was in April of 1963. Beginning on April 3rd, King and other civil rights activists peacefully gathered in Birmingham, a segregated city at the time, to march on City Hall, boycott segregationist merchants, and focus the nation's attention on Jim Crow policies across the South. In response, Birmingham passed an ordinance that prohibited public gatherings without an official permit. King challenged the ordinance, but on April 10th, a state circuit court upheld it. Undeterred, King applied for a permit. Birmingham denied it. But that didn't stop King, who said on April 11th, We cannot, in all good conscience, obey such an injunction which is an unjust, undemocratic, and unconstitutional misuse of the legal process. Even with a shortage of funds to bail out arrested marchers, King organized again on April 12th. He was arrested for the crime of publicly gathering without a permit. Upon his release eight days later, King stated, I was arrested Friday on a charge of parading without a permit. Now, There is nothing wrong with an ordinance which requires a permit for a parade, but when the ordinance is used to preserve segregation and to deny citizens the First Amendment privilege of peaceful assembly and peaceful protest, then it becomes unjust. Of course, King was right. Birmingham officials arbitrarily decided who could and could not exercise their First Amendment rights. People that City Hall agreed with could speak and assemble. Dissenters like Martin Luther King Jr. could not. You may think that these types of government powers, which were used to shield Jim Crow laws, were swept away by the civil rights revolution that King ushered in. Not at all. Still today, nearly 60 years after King wrote his letter from a Birmingham jail, governments across the United States use self-assigned permitting powers to stop people from exercising their basic American rights. Worst of all, this practice is often used by government-run colleges and universities, the very places where freedom of expression, speech, thought, and assembly should be most protected. Get this. In early 2020, Georgia Tech, a public university, denied equal treatment to Students for Life for a speaking event featuring Martin Luther King Jr.'s niece by withholding mandatory student funding that was freely available to other student groups to host events. The reasoning? Alveda King, a pro-life Christian, speaks a message that is inherently religious. This mind-boggling rationale would have stopped Martin Luther King Jr. himself from speaking on campus. Not surprisingly, repeating Birmingham's unlawful actions of choosing who can and can't exercise their First Amendment freedoms cost Georgia Tech $50,000 in damages and attorney's fees in response to a federal lawsuit filed by Alliance Defending Freedom. Similar scenarios have played out on campuses across the nation, including at California State University San Marcos, where the same administrators who gave $300,000 to pro-abortion groups and others with favored views also denied Students for Life just $500 to bring a pro-life speaker to campus. Some college administrators have followed Birmingham's example even more closely. Rather than treating the First Amendment as the only permission slip a student needs to speak on campus, Public universities, including Arkansas State University and Georgia Gwinnett College, have resorted to Birmingham-style tactics to silence their own students. Officials at Arkansas State University, for example, kicked student Ashlyn Hoggard off the patio in front of the student union and threatened her with a violation of the student code of conduct just for setting up a table to recruit students for a new chapter of Turning Point USA. In response, the state of Arkansas enacted campus free speech legislation to prevent public campuses from engaging in viewpoint discrimination that violates students' First Amendment rights. Meanwhile, administrators at Georgia Gwinnett College prevented student Chika Uzigbunam from peacefully sharing his Christian faith with fellow students on campus twice. First, they said he needed advance permission to use one of two tiny speech zones that were only open 10% of the week and made up less than 1% of the campus. If the entire campus were the size of a football field, these two zones would have been the size of a piece of notebook paper. But even after he obtained permission to speak in the speech zones, the college stopped him from speaking because some students objected to his religious message. 
In these cases, as in hundreds more across the nation, Alliance Defending Freedom has stood with students whose freedoms are under threat. Incarcerated in the Birmingham jail, Martin Luther King Jr. wrote, The goal of America is freedom. Our destiny is tied up with America's destiny. This notion of shared destiny, that we must preserve others' freedoms to enjoy freedom ourselves, is a crucial and timeless insight. A healthy and free society must be committed to truly open discourse and the free exchange of ideas. And for such a society to exist and flourish, we must all commit together to protect our shared destiny. Become part of the solution to protect our shared destiny today. Visit adflegal.org slash standforfreedom.